Welcome, everyone. I'm Renee Barnett. I'm Sean Holsell. And I'm James Martin. This is What's Left. When I said, hey, hey, what's wrong? Hi guys. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, for those uh, following us. Uh, morning, evening, uh, afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Uh, again, another welcome to What's Left. We've got a really good show uh, coming up. Um, we have uh, Barrett Tomasi from the ETF joining us uh, shortly. But first, Renee, uh, I suppose we're, we're starting the show with a bit of breaking news, I suppose, or sort of current events. Um, and uh, we were just discussing before we came on air about uh, something that's, that's happened with, uh, with you. Um, over oh, you. yeah, it, it was it was really interesting. Well, I just thought, you know, it might be it might be well to give, um, you know, people, our viewers and listeners a little bit of a heads up and um, on how insidious some of the disinformation that's out there can be. And it, it just seeps into every part of our lives. I was really astounded um, yesterday to be in my little next door app. And that's an app. Uh, a lot of you may have that app in the United States, um, but it connects you with people that in your are in your immediate neighborhood. And you might, post on there that you've got free kittens or that uh, you're going to have a, 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 some kind of a benefit uh, yard sale or something, or you're uh, warning your neighbors that someone's been seen lurking late at night in the neighborhood, or whether you might just be looking for a gardener. Hey, neighbors, can you recommend someone that's not too expensive? And so it's that sort of thing. So you sort of feel like you're in a in a comfortable place it's your neighbors you know uh for goodness sakes so i was scrolling through last night um or actually i got a notification and it and i thought that sounds weird and so i clicked on it and it was uh from a publication where they were talking about uh the crackdown on you know lgbtq rights here in the united states and how with the advent of all these new laws that now far left extremist activists are sending out, you know, basically sex change kits to children across the nation. They call, they're calling them queer kits and that they're sending them so that people can continue their, uh, you know, their uh, transition, uh, well, of course, it's just utter BS, you know, which was what my response to it was. And I said, you know, it's, this is would be just so ridiculous, except that some people are going to believe this. So I thought, who would say such a thing? And I followed the publication and found that it was something called the Epoch Times, owned by the uh, far right wing extremist Chinese religious movement called Falun Gong. So, and here they are in our little next door neighbor apps and everything. So I would just urge people, you know, when you see something that sort of riles you up before you take any kind of action, respond to it, share it or anything like that, just follow, follow the source. That will tell you a lot about which way this uh, publication or this individual is going to be leaning. Um, and then, you know, if you want to uh, take further steps, fine. For me, you know, I saw all I needed to see right there. And I said, OK, that makes sense at how this is turning up. And it's just another form of disinformation. So it's seeping into every part of our social media, uh, for sure. I, I, I was just astounded and appalled by it. Um, and I'm hoping that people don't fall for it. But unfortunately, some will, because it will speak to where they live, you know. 
I mean, we, we've said this, you know, on, well, a sister show, Night Vision, uh, when people are looking at uh, history, um, to bear in mind that history is always written by someone and usually with a purpose, um, you know, and if you were to base your views upon opinions as opposed to the facts of the matter, uh, you're not really going to get too far. But equally, just as important is, um, you know, day to day, um, if you're, you know, you're reading an article generally, um, you know, and if it sounds unusual, again, try and find the person who is publishing the article and try and find a little bit more about them. There is a trend, and again, just as a, a sort of warning of a particular um, more ex extremist, I would suggest uh, newspapers to just put a uh, reporter uh, if you see that, um, then that should be a real red herring that uh, if someone is happy to publish a opinion piece, uh, but not happy to publish their name, uh, that should be a bit of a, uh, a red flag. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the utter nonsense that, you know, even in, you know, small towns and villages, people are receiving leaflets uh, about... Uh, you know, uh, gender identity kits or whatever it is, again, just it flies in the face of the, um, you know, reality of a lot of struggles that the LGBTQ plus community uh, face day to day and uh, more leaflets from more right wing um, uh, uh, perspectives is not what we in the community need. Absolutely, and and it's it's insidious in that it's it, they're trying to manufacture consent through these these news things and and make people believe that this is an issue that most people care about. I mean, at the moment, I think more people care about keeping a roof over their heads and the lights on and food in the fridge rather than than targeting some of the most maligned and and sort of placed to the edge of society communities there are <clears throat> who are already going through through some of the biggest struggles ever with with mainstream politics targeting and we don't need sort of the fringes making that the talking point and dehumanizing people and making <clears throat> making questioning people's humanity and making people sort of have to to prove their humanity we're all we're all humans trying to get by we don't need need these groups trying to malign us and, and drive wedges through our communities yeah the vision is the key to to what they're doing divide us up and they can conquer us, you know, but if we stick together as just human beings, for goodness sakes, neighbors and human beings, then um, they can't do much. But once they get us all divided and hating each other, and if you look, it's like, you know, every group, particularly here in the United States has been attacked, you know, it's like uh, otherizing people, you know, uh, I'm not like that. Therefore, you know, I don't want that in my life. I, you know, it, it's like not seeing um, our commonalities rather than, you know, trying to hype up some uh, proposed, you know, or supposed differences. And again, you know, if anyone's been following this manufactured uh, split as well, even on uh, we were just talking for the show, uh, a TikTok video. I mean, Renee, uh, we've been out on our travels and uh, we've had the Chinese, I think I've made Italian, uh, I think I've made uh, Japanese and things like this. I, who would I um, uh, be, um, I suppose, uh, if I thought that uh, what I was actually serving you was racism on a plate? But that seems to have been one TikToker's... Uh, take on the way that we discuss food and that again has caused uh, another uh, nonsense argument between uh, the two countries but I have to just say um, uh, whilst we've opened the show with you know, Division there is a another show that's going on at the moment uh, across Europe and Australia for some reason oh boy. Uh, and that is the Eurovision Song Contest, which was uh, designed to bring <laughs> people together uh, through song. And uh, I have to say, some of the songs, um, well, I'm sure you, you're a punified on saying that was absolutely awful. Please don't play that song again. Um, 
But yeah, speaking about bringing uh, people together, we've got a uh, really special guest uh, joining us just now. Um, over to you, Sean. Yeah, we've got joining us this evening uh, a comrade of mine, Barra, from the trans uh, the ETF European Transport Workers Federation, based over in Brussels. Uh, Barra's had ten years with the global international trade union movement. Uh, working first in Italy as the head of international policies in the Italian Transport Workers Union. So, without further ado, we'll welcome Barra to the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks Hi. for having me today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so uh, lots and lots of uh, of uh, uh, questions, uh, Barra. Um, I, I suppose, uh, you know, without stepping on uh, at Sean's toes. Uh, just too much for me. Could you give us um, a bit of a sense as to how you see Europe at the moment? Uh, you know, you're, you're based uh, in Belgium, um, you know, uh, surrounded by beautiful countries. Belgium is a beautiful country in itself. What's the situation like in uh, and across uh, the Europe, gem uh, the Europe, uh, Europe generally? Yeah, well, uh, it's, I would say, a bit critical. Uh, it's quite worrying, especially for the union movement. We will, we, I guess, we will talk a bit about my my own country, Italy. But in general, in Europe, as you know, we are facing this big race of a right, and Italy is not the the only one in Europe to to have a the only country in Europe to have a, five, a far right government. Uh, if I remember correctly, it started more or less around 2015. So over the last more than five years, uh, we are witnessing this this big race, and of course, it's it's concerning for us. Um, why? Well, because of our beliefs, of course, but also what is concerning, at least for me, is that all this even leader party, parties, uh, right-wing parties that were leader at least uh, a few years ago are constantly increasing their, their electoral support, their political power in Europe, uh, because in many cases we have very unstable governments all, all around Europe. And of course, to the other parties, they need the support even of the far right, and as you can imagine, if in case they need it, they they are keen to use it. Uh, they represent, to me, they represent a real threat to 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 liberal democracy in Europe. And what we are most concerned about, of course, Italy is the is one of the last ones uh, in time. But there are other countries in Europe that are facing the same the same situation, and the unions there are having a really really hard time. So what we are trying to do, at least at ETF level with the with the with the transport uh, unions in this country, is to support them. Uh, I would mention very briefly Hungary, for instance, but also Poland, uh, Sweden. Italy, in France also. Well, uh, Marine Le Pen, she she didn't she didn't win the elections, but she got a lot of power. She did get a lot of votes, too many. Well, you know, and you know, just say this uh, on Le Pen, it, it's not just uh, uh, the presidentials; um, it's in local government, um, you know, in cities um, such as. Perpignan, where you find that there is someone who's quite openly, from my view at least, the fascist uh, in charge. There's lots of advance of these very extreme ideologies. And yeah, you might think of France as, you know, uh, perhaps stemming the tide, but really that's not the case. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Vera, you know, you're, you're from Italy, your home country, and, you know, fairly recently, um, you've changed administrations to uh, elect a new president. And obviously, you know, that person is, is from the right wing and, you know, sort of spouts these 
fascistic views from what I can tell. And here in America, we have, you know, sort of similar situation where we have, you know, one uh, part of our government going way far to the right. And uh, you were talking or, or we were speaking earlier about uh, people's rights, you know, being curtailed or taken away, unemployment rights and and entitlements, things like that. And um, we're having the same talks here uh, from one side uh, of the country or, or one side of the uh, of the government. Why do you think, you know, I mean, obviously your president was elected. Why do you think, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking you uh, this question for my own benefit to figure out what's happening in my country, but why do you think that people vote against their own good? If they know that, you know, this person is trying to, you know, in the United States, they're trying to uh, sunset uh, the our social security, uh, cut, you know, unemployment, cut benefits. I mean, first thing to go was, you know, like meals for kids uh, here. So why do you think that people vote against themselves so much? What's the attraction? Yeah, well... Uh, I think there are many, many reasons, but basically what I experienced at least, because I don't live in Italy anymore, but I, I come back quite often, as much as I can. And, you know, we like coffee. We are really crazy about coffee. We go to the coffee, coffee places. We spoke, we speak to each other, of course. <laughs> we make comments about everything, uh, including politics. So I really also like to uh, just listen to the mood of the man of the street, we say. Yes. It's really concerning again. Why? Because uh, in our case in Italy, first of all, it grew over the years uh, in, a, in a very interesting way. So as you said at the beginning, first rule was to divide us up in order to conquer us which mm. means that when you face you know in italy everywhere a bit everywhere of course every country has these issues but in italy we it's very sensitive uh, the issue of uh, migrants but this is just one of the of, of the, the the many other issues that we have unemployment rates very high and and so on and so on um they create they have been creating space for this kind of discussion but in a very bad way like putting people against other people interests against other interests mm -hmm. and it worked it worked because of the media as well now that i live abroad i'm really impressed when i go back or when i watch italian tv here in belgium uh, I'm impressed about the, the, the way they present things. Even in the, in the mm, even in the news, I have the feeling that it's really like you cannot have an unbiased view on anything because it's really difficult to 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 make think to make people think about what is happening. So this is one point. The other point I must say, I mean, it, it breaks my heart, but I think it's the truth. Also, the left in Italy hasn't been able to, to give a proper answer because it's really fragmented, really fragmented. And while they are able to join forces together, if we have time, we will talk about it because even now the, the current uh, center... Um, um right coalition is made of different parties and we know that they they don't they don't openly fight against each other but of course there, there are there are issues in the left they've never managed to put people together and and points together in a constructive way mm. So yeah. uh, this is another point. But mainly, I think that one of the biggest problems is, is that they are really working and pushing on the stomach of the people. I don't know how to, 
to explain it in proper English, but you know, they are making propaganda on things that are really, really sensitive for everybody. They present it probably from their point of view in the right way, so the, in the way that they can reach the majority of the people. Yeah. This did the trick, and also, uh, I'm sorry, it's not nice to say that, but there is a lot of disinformation. As you said at the beginning, again, people are, are not in, interested in going to the source of the information. They barely read. In most cases, they do it on the social media yeah. without checking anything, and they just believe. Yeah, it's really interesting you, you talk about the left because I think that is a problem with the left across Europe and, and the United States where we can't seem to hold ourselves together. Where we as, as a movement talk about solidarity a lot, we don't seem to be able to do it as well as the right. And they seem much better at, at getting over the, the minor differences, coming together to, to put the, the, neck, the boots on our necks. It's, it seems to be a constant theme for the left. But just looking back at the trade union movement in Italy, do, do you think there's any lessons to be learned and, and what we could maybe look at doing in other countries going forward and, and the next time the left have an opportunity, obviously spurred on by the trade union movement? Because for me, myself, I, I don't think the left is ever going to be coherent and organised without that trade union influence, I think our movements have got to be at the heart of any sort of political push against the right and far right. So do you think there's lessons we can learn from, from Italy? Well, there are always lessons to learn. Uh, maybe in this case, okay, the union in Italy, especially CGL, they've been always very strong. I mean, their opposition has always been very strong. And they keep on doing that. Um, but of course, what I what has been discussed over the, 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 the last weeks, and I will explain you later, uh, is the fact that uh, TGL had the um, they had their congress, the big confederation congress in um, in March this year, and they decided to invite. Uh, Giorgia Meloni, so the Prime Minister, who was elected in September, as I told you. Uh, this decision has not been taken, uh, has not been welcomed by all the members of the Union, all the delegates in the, in the, in the Union, as you can imagine. But personally, I think, and it has always been like this, the, 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 the biggest and largest Union in Italy at Congress, invites the prime minister. So she was invited as prime minister of Italy, not as Giorgia Meloni, head of Fratelli d'Italia. Okay. And this is one point. And also I think they showed that somehow we are, as unions, we are keen to find a way for a dialogue. And she accepted. Uh, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not able to judge her decision, but she gave a speech, a 30 minute speech at Congress. Uh, the audience was totally silent. Some of the comrades, they decided to, to leave, to leave the room, singing Bella Ciao, but the, but the majority, they stayed in silence. And basically what she said was, um, we are uh, we are keen to listen to you, so please uh, put forward your your demands, your requests. Most probably, we won't agree on everything that you propose, but you can stay ensure that the government will listen to you without any kind of prejudice. But this was not followed by. Yeah, by by the action of the government in the in the following months, the only moment where she was applauded, let's say, was when she mentioned the fact that the CGL uh, had uh, in uh, in October 2021 
they had uh, they were victims of a fascist attack to the to the to the offices to the main building of of the union so the headquarters ba basically they've been attacked they've been devastated um during a no green pass demonstration because in italy we also had this big discussion regarding the green pass for for covid 19 so uh the workers at a certain point were requested to show in order to go to work to show if they had the certification of the vaccination or they had covid they recovered uh, they uh, they had negative tests this kind of stuff so they took this occasion to 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 attack the the union. Um, it was really really awful. I can assure you. They went through through the offices floor by floor. They kicked uh, the doors. They destroyed many paintings and other um, pieces of art that are in the in, in this main building and that that have historical uh meaning for uh, for the workers for uh, for the unionists so oh my gosh it was really it was really really bad and then uh i remember so this was a uh, 9th of october um basically the, the the attack was organized by forza nuova which is a very very small party they declared themselves um uh, neo-nazis so it's it's clear no doubts about it uh, and after that, so twelve people were um, uh, were taken, were uh, were caught, and of course we had a lot of solidarity messages and uh, and support from the union movement in general in Europe and and internationally. It it was great, and in the following week, so the sixteenth of October, the big the three big confederations in Italy that decided to, to organize a, a big demonstration, an anti-fascist demonstration. And I think it was like the biggest demonstration that unions in Italy had over the last 20 years, probably, with more than 2,000 2, people that rallied in Rome. It was in Piazza San Giovanni, which is the, the traditional site where we have, we organized demonstrations. So, we had a lot of support, but of course, this was uh, this was really, yeah. Again, the the evidence that people that say that uh, fascist is is gone, is over, is not is not there anymore. It's absolutely not true. And what the unions wanted to to show is that we don't want in Italy, but everywhere, we don't want this to be back. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, one of the key things. I mean, I'm involved with a group called the Battle of Stockton, where uh, fascists back in the uh, 30s were prevented from marching and taking over that uh, town. And we see, you know, certainly in the press, the you know, certainly in the UK, where we we have a very right wing government with um, a far right wing, I would argue, uh, again, fascist Home Secretary. They were deporting uh, those seeking refuge in Britain to uh, Rwanda, um, you know, a, a government controlled by a dictator, low on human rights, if any at all. Um, <clears throat> you know, we we see then, uh, coupled with that, attacks on trade unions who, you know, the trade union movement or labour union movement is about getting workers' rights and pay and that's just in the workplace, outside of the workplaces. Things like your rights to holidays, uh, your rights to uh, things like welfare entitlements. And again, um, we were just discussing before uh, the show, one of the more chilling things, and there are many uh, from the uh, present uh, iteration uh, of the government. I mean, I'll, we'll ask you later, Barry, if we have time, what you think Berlusconi uh, feels about uh, being told what to do. But, um, you know, one of the chilling things has been this uh, enactment in Italy of removing unemployment. Um, now I'm going to call it entitlement, but unemployment subsidies, um, you know, for those who, for whatever reason, have lost the job, you know, whether they can't work due to a disability, 
um, whether it's just due to the economic circumstance, you know, whatever, whatever, that the government's uh, getting rid of that. Do you see there being um, a large opposition to that, given um, the Prime Minister? I should just clarify that it's the Prime Minister of Italy, not the President of Italy. Uh, the president of Italy is a different political party. The president uh, is green. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Love him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the, the prime minister uh, has used mm -hmm. this rhetoric that we're seeing in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada and France, uh, the so-called great replacement theory. And one aspect of it is migrants are lazy. They don't want to work. Uh, and that this is a disease that's afflicted Italians, and that's the reason for removal of the unemployment benefits. I mean, I don't know what you—I can imagine what you what you think uh, about it. But do you see this being opposed effectively? Yeah. Well, basically, this is linked to very, very again interesting um, fact that happened very recently. It was it was very close to the first of May. You know how important is the 1st of May for all of us. In Italy, I don't know if you, if, you, if you know, but the three big confederations again, apart from the demonstrations and, you know, the rallies, they also organize a huge, huge concert in Rome, which is for free for any, any, anyone who wants to, to join but with big names of the music from the music scene so from uh, international artists and italian artists so it's something really huge the prime minister uh, called the unions the day before at seven so the the 30th of april because the government decided to have the um, the council of ministers on the first of may Labor Day to discuss all these kind of measures. So, of course, the discussion was between the government and the unions. So they needed to they needed to be there. But they didn't. I mean, the government didn't offer any room for negotiation on this. And yeah, the 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 measures we you were talking about. Uh, yeah, include the elimination, I don't know if the translation is, is right, but literally is the citizenship income that was um, uh, introduced by the one of, the, not, the, not the previous with Draghi, but with the government from the uh, Five Star Movement. And then they said that we launch that they will launch the inclusion of allowances for family with disabled members, minors, people over 60, so a series of, of measures. But the unions replied that this is not what we've been asking for and for a long time, because what the union wants, first of all, is a ra raise of wages, but a substantial raise, a real tax reform, because this is another huge point, at least in Italy, but, but not only. There is, in Italy, there is a lot of underpaid work. In some cases, you even have to find yourself in the situation of paying to work. So this is really, really concerning. And it's not acceptable anymore. That's what, what the union said. Uh, and from the other side, so center left, the mm, Partito Democratico, Democratic Party, uh, they have a new leader now, Ellie Schlein, and she uh, proposed another solution, so new measures to increase job, um, to, to promote, to, to try to eliminate uh, by time temporary contracts and, and all this, but they, they're refusing everything. So our position as uh, unions is clear. The point is that there is, there is really no room for discussion. So she came to the Congress. Of course, they, they, most of them, politicians, they do that. But she came to the Congress. She said, we are keen to listen to you. 
and we will we will have a proper discussion but the discussion is not there plus all the polemics regarding this this thing of organizing the council of ministers on the 1st of may because she said yeah but in the on the 1st of may there are people who keep on working even the ones who have to organize the concert you are organizing so maybe you should organize the concert on another day so this is the level of the discussion. Can I just add for, for context for uh, for those uh, really outside of Europe? Uh, yes, please. Uh, um, the 1st of May is uh, one of the most important days uh, of the year. Um, I mean, I'll exclude religious celebrations from that, but um, what we're referring to is there are two key events. We have International Workers Memorial Day, which is usually the Friday before uh, May Day, um, where we remember those who have passed before us in uh, both in work and outside of work. And then um, a bank holiday, a public holiday, a day off, however you want to describe it, is International Workers' Day, which occurs on May Day. And you find across Europe, um, even in the UK, it's a day off, but you find across Europe, um, there are protests and demonstrations um, and real acts of solidarity, actually. Um, uh, again, reminding us that we're, you know, there's much more that brings us together than not. Um, and w no surprise at all to hear it's, that. It's, it's interesting that, you know, here in America, we celebrate what we call Labor Day in September. I wonder why America especially particularly the unions haven't picked up on the May 1st International Workers Day is it, it's odd isn't it and here Labor Day means you get a long weekend and you go and uh, go do a barbecue you know that's it I we never see or at least unless I've just been under a rock we never see activism around um labor day here it's just oh we get a free day that's what it is to us which is very sad so i i just want to jump back a minute barra uh obviously we've seen the far right organizing across europe yeah uh, in britain at the moment we've got a group called patriotic alternative who again very much targeting migrant workers also getting involved in some anti-lgbt stuff as well uh what what were some of the signs of of how how this group of fascists in italy have sort of organized to take power how long have they been been sort of around how long have they been organizing can you talk to us a bit about that well uh they've been there uh, okay officially well, let's start with this. Officially, so Giorgia Meloni is the first prime minister in Italy, first women, woman prime minister in Italy, and she's also the first prime minister from the far right after the Second World War. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but in other forms, uh, these kind of parties were already there historically in Italy. So from uh, 1948, when we had, you know, after the Second World War, and then we, we had the Constitution uh, after the, the referendum in 46, for, uh, to, the Italians were uh, asked to choose between a demo democracy, well, Republican monarchy. So from that moment on, uh in different forms but we had far right and somehow fascist parties since ever although the constitution says clearly it can it's a constitution that was born immediately after the second world war so say states uh clearly that it's illegal to have fascist parties in italy so it should the, the fascist party should be dissolved. This is more or less what the constitution says. But of course, then in fact, reality is different. Fratelli d'Italia is just the, the, the last one, but before that, 
there was another party yeah, in the 70s called Movimento Social Italiano, which was really inspired uh, by that. So uh, it, the, the, we had waves, let's say. Because if you remember, we mentioned Silvio Berlusconi, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when we took, so he took the, the, the power for a long time, mm -hmm. again with ups and downs. But he was a government as a prime minister in 94. Then in 2000, uh, until 2006, then 2011 again. Uh, he managed somehow to create a different kind of uh, center-right bloc. He involved the new fascist parties, but he was controlling everything. And he was, there are many differences because Berlusconi and Forza Italia, his party, always declared themselves pro-Europe for instance, so supportive, supporting Europe, while the extreme right usually doesn't. Uh, but he managed somehow to, to keep a balance. After he lost a lot of power, like lately, and Lega Nord, the other party, now Salvini is, is the, the leader of Lega Nord. Lega Nord was born as an autonomous party. They even wanted to be independent from Italy, right? Then they changed because, of course, they need to adapt. And now uh, there are still some differences. But he Salvini was was able has been able to to keep the the the, the biggest power at least in central uh, right for many years until Meloni managed to be the real opposition. Because in the previous government with Draghi, which was not an elected uh, government, it was a technical government for the reasons you know, um, Meloni was the only one opposing. And she managed to, and I have to, somehow I feel a bit, bit of, I, I admire her somehow, because she really managed to, first of all, be the the only one to be in the opposition so a clear identity you like it or not for the people who decided to vote for her because she got a lot of votes not only from the people who usually or traditionally voted for other um cent center uh, right parties but also from center left uh, of course, she manipulated a bit and she used many, many, many topics, many, she misused uh, many problems that Italy was facing and still is facing, but she, she, did, she did her job. And now the problem in this coalition, they have the majority, you know, the vast majority. It's exactly this. She is the only woman also with two men, very powerful men that don't want to give up on their power and don't like, as James said, her to be the boss. Yeah. He's bossy in any case, but they don't like yeah. her. And that makes, uh, you know, in a, in a strange way, I mean, without getting into my uh, sort of interest and involvement in global um, politics, it, I, where the, uh, the left a week, uh, Sean mentioned you have this, um this total acceptance um of um you know it, the stp passokification as we say um uh, named after the greek um so called left wing um uh political party that i notice is doing well in the polls again um but this sort of very weak um oh well we'll give uh, a little bit of something to you that will keep you quiet mm. but really we we're, we're not going to repeal, revoke any of the um, legislation that has been used to attack workers. Um, you know, uh, we, we see, uh, we, you know, we, we, we see all of this. And I think, well, at the minute, um, in the absence of any real, I'm going to say it, class identity, uh, this is the, 
um, the main issue for me in uh, left-wing parties, there isn't an understanding. Most of the politicians that we see, generally anyway, haven't had what I would term a proper job. They've not ever had to struggle to put um, uh, food on the table. Mm. Uh, you know, they, We've got a cost of living, and they don't know how to reply to it because it doesn't affect them and never has done. Um, and so... When I look at Italy, I, I sort of think, well, there's this very fragile coalition and it must be eating at the, the um, you know, and again, just saying it, the men um, who have been used to it being their way forever. Mm -hmm. And now we have this uh, this fascist. And I'm just going to give a quick quote to everyone. Um, if you think that we're being uh, unfair, I, I visit Italy uh, quite often um, and uh, Italian trade unionists and just people that I know generally find what Benito Mussolini did as to be a stain on Italy. Apart from the prime minister that we've been talking about, who said, quote, this is a quote uh, from 1996, I think Mussolini was a good politician. Everything he did, he did for Italy. And uh, we haven't had politicians like that in the past 50 years. Um, there's no doubt where she lies, but how stable is this coalition and will this be the end of her do you what are your thoughts oh my gosh <laughs> well uh i unfortunately i think they are quite stable mm. my, my perception, but she knows how to manage the power uh they are as we said uh, before the le at least in Italy, the 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 right wing is much more. Uh, they have much more solidarity than us somehow, mm. or at least they manage to uh, address the internal uh, issue in a way that then works better than 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 the left. I think they have a um, a, a better message uh, messaging. Than, than, than the left does. They've got all these issues that are hot button issues for, for their base, their voter bases. And, you know, the left thinks, well, you know, we're just working away for the people here. You know, we're getting this uh, enacted and that and protecting this and that, but that's not enough. We need a stronger message. Um, to put out there that, you know, that people can carry. But I'm wondering, and this is to the whole group here, do you think that the the apparent rise, I know it's been building for, for a while, as Barra said, but do you think that the, you know, sort of uh, outward appearance of the rise of the far right has something to do with the fact that our, our, our World War II veterans are now, you know, mostly all passed away. And it's, I, I almost feel like, especially here in America, that we wouldn't have dared got, done this while our fathers and grandfathers uh, and great grandfathers were still alive. Can you know, I just, the ones who fought against this. Can I, can I give my uh, quick thoughts on this? Sure, yeah. Uh, it's the, it's the group. So, um, I played for you a video uh, from 1944, uh, which went out to the citizens of the United States. And what it did is it explained that um, autocracy, dictatorship takes over, takes root uh, when there are attacks on uh, not just civil rights, but civil freedoms. And, and also, that, and the media, yes, um, you know, the conglomeration of medias into essentially a mafia family um, and all of this. But crucially, when in times of uh, cuts, in times of uh, what they call austerity, which is a feeling, uh, you know, let's call it what it is, cuts, uh, where you have all of that, then those people who suffer the most are not the people who are enacting the cuts. It's the people. And they are then helped along by a media that says, oh, it's not the people that are up there that are voting this through. No, it's the migrant. It's this uh, religion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's someone uh, who's fell in love with someone of the same 
sex. It's their fault that you are suffering. Right. And that is, for me, where the mistakes of World War II, the thing that we actually fought for, and I'll just say so did a lot of Italians, uh, for that matter, um, for the freedoms of tyranny, um, from tyranny, uh, they have been forgot. And that's not a threat, it's a warning. Uh, that's just my view. Absolutely. And to echo everything, almost everything Jay said there, it, it's when we find extreme deprivation, uh, downturns in economies. So in Britain, we see the sort of birth of fascism with Oswald Mosley in the 1930s. Just after the Great Depression, you see people struggling for money, and the far right latch onto these ideas, push their messaging that it's all it's all that person who's brown over there's fault, mm. that you've got no housing, you can't get a job. Blame them. Don't look at the people who are who are making fortunes off the back of this, because there's always massive transfers of wealth in these times from from working people up to the top 0.1 percent, and and that's the sort of rise for me uh just to pedal back slightly as well uh i think renee you were talking about why the right is so good at this and the left aren't i think the left are very very bad apart from to be honest bernie sanders over in in the united states at uh, doing a left-wing version of populism mm. the pointing to a clear enemy which is the, the business class over there saying that's where your problem is where the right wing are very very good at using that we are almost reticent to, to point to, to where the problem is on the left in the UK or in most of Europe and, and sort of speak to people's base instincts where, where Bernie seems to be the only sort of left-wing politician I could, could think of at the moment who's very, very good at using that language and speaking and mobilising people emotionally on them sort of wavelengths. There's no surprise that he pushed Hillary so far with very, very little corporate sort of backing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we need more people like that. Yeah, and it's it's not to say that uh, you know what we what we're referring to here. If uh, people are listening, thinking, "Well, I own a shop," and you know, you've not spoke to me, we're not on about um, people who own a shop. We're on about hyper large corporations that have taken away, you know, your living um, by these huge palatial malls these concrete nightmares and things like this um you know the the economy uh, we we're, we're, we're told so often that there's not enough money to go around and yet we keep on seeing that amazon who said they can't employ permanent workers today in britain have announced that uh, well uh to defeat uh, a union organization initiative that they're, they're recruiting uh, a thousand permanent uh, workers so uh, as to avoid having to recognise the union. There's lots of money out there. It's all about political choices. And uh, in the US, for example, the sort of four-yearly event uh, of this debt ceiling, well, you know, uh, another argument might be, you know, for the Republicans and the right-wing Democrats, stop cutting taxes on corporations. They've gotten more than enough cash. It, it's, uh, it's so simple, and they know it, but that's who's backing them, and they don't want to do that. They're in the pockets of these these major corporations and and groups, political groups. It's, that's where it's, it's a shame. It's really a shame. And again, I'm back to my own, you know, question a, a while back of. What in the world makes people vote against their own interests? I mean, okay, let's say you, you know, you've done all right. You know, you're, you know, maybe you're even retiring and you've managed to uh, save up a little nest egg and you're, uh, you've got your stuff all taken care of. Well, we've all got, you know, a grandmother, uh, an old aunt or something that's living on a pension, living on, strictly, you know, here in the United States, social security benefits. And by and large, almost, you know, to a person, those people have paid into that social security system by working during the course of their lifetimes. And it's not something we're just giving for free. 
you know, not to say I think that would even be a bad thing. I think everybody deserves, you know, basic rights, you know, of, of being able to live and and subsist and, and eat. I, and of course, we don't and have medical care. Of course, we don't have any of that guarantee here. Uh, but I, I just I just don't get it. It's like, do you really want your mom being cut off of Social Security? Have you got a, you know, a spare bedroom, you know? You better get it ready for mom or grandma because she's going to be out on the street. So Again, I, I, no, it. I, I just say, Renee, on that point, we've, we've seen Bernie and the way he does politics and campaign and that movement, that grassroots movement come up from beneath him, which isn't relying on corporate sponsorship and, and corporate money. Mm-hmm. And look at how quickly that, that has risen sort of to two presidential races and, and they almost did it. I don't mm. think it'll be long before, before hopefully in America, the United States of America, we see a, a Bernie or someone coming after him in his his sort of slipstream. We do have power. a lot of young young stars coming up on the on the left side of things. Uh, so I hope you're right, Sean. I hope. Uh, well, I just hope they remember fingers. though. It, sorry, I just hope that they remember it's it's about all of us, not just them. The right. Um, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, fingers crossed. Actually, it takes uh, activism. Uh, we've got less than a minute left, Barra. Uh, oh fi- final word to you on this. Well, very, very briefly, I agree on the fact that we cannot forget, and the threat. One of the threats is that we are um, missing the people who were there physically and can could witness. I remember that uh, in my elementary school. They used to organize classes with our um, grandfathers mm. telling us what happened. Yeah. Of course, it cannot be possible in the future. But for instance, in Italy, we have an association which is very linked, of course, to, to, to the union as well, ANPI, Associazione Nazionale Partigiani, so the National Association of Partisans. And it's it's been there for a long it will be there with new people with young people who, who still believe in these values so this is what we should do i think not for uh, that, of per- course. perfect words for us to uh to finish off with so everyone what's left uh what a reminder history doesn't repeat itself um but if we don't look back to the mistakes of the past we will continue to make similar uh, mistakes uh Barra, thank you so much for for being uh, on with us and uh uh for everyone else who's been listening i've been james martin i'm sean holson oh and i'm renee barnett bringing up the rear <laughs> thanks everyone thanks you, it was a great pleasure thank you so much Barry.